Hey kids, it's time for the obligatory Metroid review! Yes, yes, well, technically I've reviewed a Metroid game before, but that was before I adopted my current style. That being said, I'm joined today by my good friend Outlaw Client to review Metroid Other M. Oh, uh, hey, thanks for letting me join in this time. I'd be more than happy to rip, I mean, uh, review this game with you, but first let me explain a little about the history of Other M. After Samus's highly successful outing in the first-person perspective via the Metroid Prime series, Nintendo once again wanted a taste of that success, but although Retro Studios had delivered what was seen as a masterfully crafted all-around solid entry by fans and critics alike, they wanted to take Samus in a much different direction, a full 3D heavily story-driven experience, something which they believed couldn't be achieved by Retro. With the series' director and co-creator Yoshio Sakamoto being impressed with the Japanese development studio, Team Ninja, and their flashy new Ninja Gaiden engine, he immediately jumped at the idea of collaborating with them in order to produce the newest entry in the Metroid series, alongside D-Rockets who took care of the cutscenes. Now let's be honest, when you put Team Ninja and females in the same sentence, what comes to mind other than Jiggle Physics? Yeah, I can't think of much either, which is why fans were quite sceptical around the idea of putting the team that gave us beach volleyball girls in charge of one of the strongest, most iconic females in video game history. But based off of the early footage, nothing seemed too out of place. Now, let's get started on the story, and I'll try not to be too harsh here. Oh, I'll try alright. The story begins with Samus recapping the past events that occurred on the planet Zebus, aka Super Metroid, via a beautifully rendered cutscene. It's here that we relive Summers' fight with Mother Brain, the organic AI hell-bent on universal eradication. Although just when it seems like Samus has met her demise, a giant Metroid and the last of its kind dubbed The Baby appears from seemingly nowhere to save the day, taking the hit for Samus, leaving it to perish while she deals the final blow. It is then that Samus awakens in the present, a short time after the aforementioned events where she's now being held in the Galactic Federation HQ. After a short training session to get the players used to the control layout, Samus announces that she's successfully exterminated the last of the Metroids, alongside the entire planet Zebes, and all of the other species that inhabited it. But uh, hey, she killed all the Metroids, so it's all good. Mass genocide aside, sometime later, Samus eventually picks up a distress signal from a remote part of space, prompting her to investigate, leading on to the events of the main story of Other M. The SOS distress signal eventually leads Samus to a seemingly abandoned bottle ship and upon arrival, Samus quickly picks up in the presence of the Galactic Federation vessel. After further exploration, Samus meets up with some familiar faces, including Generic Federation Marine 1-4, through four, alongside Anthony Higgs and the platoon's commander, Adam Malkovich. It's here where things start to get a bit interesting, right? Right off the bat, Adam wastes no time in filling out the role of the cold-hearted commander, as he refuses to share any information with Samus, who he brands an outsider. Following the assistance of getting them into the ship, and a party monster boss fight later, Adam splits up his platoon, assigning them individual roles, including Samus. Yeah, the solo bounty hunter that is no longer a part of the Galactic Federation taking orders once again. And to make matters worse, she even goes along with his requirements of not using any of her weapons until he specifically authorises their use. I mean, I've complained in the past about Samus' tendency to lose all of her upgrades in an instant from the simplest of things, such as suit failure in Prime, the Ing in Prime 2, when she gave her friend a high five. Okay, so I made that last one up. But the point I'm trying to make is that it can be pretty ridiculous at times, but none quite as ridiculous as being told not to use it when in a location riddled with dangerous unknown life forms. And don't even get Just me started on. I personally don't have an issue with Samus obeying Adam's equipment restrictions. Most people seem to think that this disempowers Samus as a character, but the way I see it, if she didn't think she could handle the mission without her equipment, she wouldn't have agreed to it in the first place. And, if anything, not using the equipment till it becomes absolutely necessary just shows how much of a badass Samus Aaron can be. The fire level pushed it a bit, but with items such as the gravity suit, space jump, and screw attack, Samus showed no hesitation in using them without authorization. Though, writing for the game is still dreadful, as is most of the voice acting. Uh, thanks. Well, when you put it that way... Uh, anyway, continuing on with the story, Samus thoroughly inspects Sector 1, alongside notable encounters with a seemingly harmless, uh, Furby, eventually leading them to discover that the Galactic Federation has been conducting illegal experiments in the form of bioweapons, and they must locate the leader of the research team, Madeline Bergman. This leads Samus into Sector 2, where she encounters the fleeing Madeline in a chase that eventually leads them into an ambush by one of the Marines in Adams' platoon. 
Do I know who he is? No. Do I want to know who he is? Yes. Do we get to find out who he is? Hell no. Which leaves this as another dead end plot twist to the end of Other M. Guess we better forget about this little event now, shouldn't we? After surviving the onslaught, Madeline explains to Samus how the Galactic Federation were working on a bioweapon, and while she reassures Samus that they aren't working on creating another mother brain, she lets her know that it's instead a Metroid breeding program, alongside one that could assume full control of Metroids, commanding them at will. Uh, what's there to worry about again? Along the line, Samus encounters a purple dinosaur-like creature that proceeds to attack her, but she eventually gets the better of it, and also discovers that it was in fact the Furby that she had previously encountered on two separate occasions. Her next orders being to track down the purple dinosaur and take it out. Uh, nothing personal, Barney. Upon tracking down the creature to the geothermal power plant, Samus quickly discovers that the beast's final form is none other than a clone of her nemesis, Ridley, leading on to what just may be one of the most cringeworthy scenes in the game. Upon her realisation, Samus is immediately struck by fear and is unable to attack, because it's not like she faced him on two separate occasions on Zebes, no, which results in Anthony stepping in to save her and losing his life in the process. After finally snapping out of her sissy trance, Samus proceeds to defeat Ridley, at least until he escapes in a rather straightforward battle. Yeah, once again, I don't really have an issue with the whole post-traumatic stress disorder towards Ridley thing. One, the time span she was standing there doing nothing was more than likely just how long the moment felt to Samus rather than how long the event actually was. Two, yes, Samus has fought four times prior to this, if we're assuming Metroid Prime is still canon. But each of those times she fought Ridley, she never killed him completely. In Metroid 1, he was just severely injured and was given a mechanical body part in Metroid Prime. Same goes for Prime 3, and in Super Metroid, Ridley was finished off once and for all because, well, I doubt anything could survive a planet exploding. I think it's only natural to be shocked and confused if the creature that murdered your entire family that you killed by planet annihilation came back from the dead. Hell, I'd probably piss myself. Grieving Anthony's death, and unable to contact Adam, Samus takes it upon herself to stop the Metroid breeding program and put an end to MB before they reach overwhelming levels, dooming mankind in the process. Upon arrival at the Metroid breeding lab, aka Sector Zero, Samus encounters, you guessed it, a Metroid, but ponders for a moment upon her receiving flashbacks from her encounter with the baby back on Zebes. Snapping out of her daydream, Samus quickly assumes firing position, as if ready to take a shot, which is interrupted by a shot to the back deactivating the various suit and rendering her unconscious. After she comes around, we find out that it's none other than Adam who fired the shot, who later explains that he shot her because she wouldn't have been able to destroy it herself, due to their likely cold resistance. I mean, shooting her in the back while the Metroid is present probably wasn't the best idea, and if his theory that the Metroids couldn't be frozen was true, his gun wouldn't have been effective, resulting in Samus being wide open for attack. After Adam gives a speech about why he has to stop the Metroids himself, he then proceeds to enter Sector Zero, detaching it from the main bottle ship, manually setting off the explosions so that they'd be eliminated without a trace. <laughs> Cue cutscene with Adam's final moments. <laughs> uh, could someone pass the popcorn? You know, all things considered, the scene with Adam's death was probably the m most effectively executed scene in the game. Which isn't to say it's good, but it was perfectly tolerable. After escaping another near-death experience by activating her gravity suit right at the last second, Samus eventually discovers another living scientist who refuses to speak to her out of fear and instead proceeds to run away and lock her in a room, alongside opening another chamber which releases the Metroid synthesizing Queen Metroid. <laughs> this is how VIPs are treated nowadays. Now, the fight can get a bit annoying at times, with Metroids constantly attacking you while you frantically attempt to aim at the Queen in, its, in the immobile first-person mode, but the real problem comes when you have to deal the final blow, since you're expected to use a power bomb to get the job done as your health is slowly stepped away. Only problem is the power bomb wasn't previously available before the point, and with absolutely no indication that you're now able to use it, like they so kindly decided to do with every other power up in the game, will probably result in a few player deaths the first time around. <laughs> Not me, of course. Uh, yeah, so I died the first time. But it isn't much of a problem since you don't have to restart the entire battle, so you'll probably figure it out eventually. It was just something that bugged me a bit. So, a wild chase later, Samus manages to confront the scientist who explains that she's in fact the real Madeline Bergman, 
while the previous scientist was in fact a faker who really goes by the name of MB. That's right, the experiment that was supposed to control the Metroids and space pirates telepathically. And news just in, she's gone out of control and seeks to take revenge on all of mankind. Appearing right on cue, MB, who's now referred to as Melissa, threatens to shoot Madeline Bergman for her apparent failings, but is suddenly intercepted by the Galactic Federation, causing a shootout to ensue. Following the short boss fight, aka Amen take a single shot, Melissa is frozen and quickly apprehended, or killed, whichever one, prompting the commander to step in and basically tell Samus, thanks for helping us, now get lost, since Adam and his crew no longer exist. To everyone's surprise, Anthony appears explaining that he just narrowly managed to survive the fall to his fiery demise through the use of his ice gun and a whole lot of luck, eventually explaining how he has the right to custody over Madeline due to direct orders for higher-ups, shutting up Commander What's-His-Face in the process, and so they all lived happily ever after, the end. Well, okay, it doesn't quite end there. Grieving Adam's death, Samus decides to return to the bottle ship one last time in order to recover a highly valuable irreplaceable item, aka Adam's helmet. But as Summers traverses the deserted ship, she is greeted by a very familiar foe, the monstrous spectre known as Fantoon. <laughs> uh, glad to see he was able to find work again after Super Metroid. The boss fight isn't too difficult, just be ready to dodge a crap ton of projectiles. With Fantoon defeated, Samus decides to take off her power suit in order to pick up the helmet, leaving her exposed as the iconic countdown sequence proceeds, giving her some time to escape back to the ship within the nick of time, flying off as the bottled ship explodes in the distance, thus concluding the story for today, kids. Yep, I'm surprised we got through this entire story segment without once mentioning the in-your-face theme of motherhood. On that note, really glad I discovered that this game has a skip cutscene button. Greatly improved the experience, even if it made some gameplay segments more confusing than they originally were. This time around, the controls are entirely mapped to the Wii Remote, with no nunchuck support whatsoever, meaning that you'll be traversing the 3D environment with the D-pad alone which felt quite awkward for me and wasn't something I got too used to, whilst 1 and 2 button are mapped to firing your weapon and jumping respectively, in which the jump button can be used to pull off a wall jump, aka the kick jump, if there are two parallel walls close enough to each other. The A button is used to transform in and out of Morph Ball at will, and when doing so will change the function of the 1 button so that you use bombs instead. So, oh, and of course there's the home button which you can press to exit the game, which I think I'll be doing right about... I mean on second thought, I'll talk a bit more about the missile feature. By pointing the Wii Remote towards the screen, Samus' perspective will switch to the first person, much like the Prime series, which not only lets you examine the surroundings, but also acts as your only means of using missiles when locked onto a specific target or object. Also, you can't move an inch. I'm not kidding. This time around, Samus is forced to remain stationary while aiming, which potentially makes dealing with multiple enemies more of a hassle than it should be at times. <laughs> Definitely my least favourite feature. Oh, and Samus can also restore some health with the new concentration ability, which is activated by tilting the Wii Remote into a vertical position by and holding A when her health is at a low enough level. If her health isn't low enough, she will instead replenish her missiles, which is a pretty nifty feature. In terms of collectible items, the energy and missile tanks make a return, which increases your energy count and number of missiles you can hold by one respectively, alongside the new E recovery tank, which increases the amount of energy restored through concentration and the level needed to perform it. The actual charge, which increases the charge speed of the charge gauge and the energy part, functioning in a Zelda-esque fashion by allowing an energy tank to be created after four are collected. Another huge change is that health will no longer drop from enemies and instead will have to be recharged at one of the many save stations scattered around the ship, which isn't too much of a problem seeing as they are quite plentiful. I thought the movement with the deep pad felt pretty natural considering the environments were designed with 2D sensibilities. It was a great throwback to the old school Metroids let down only by the game world being more linear than Metroid Fusion. However, I feel the game is at its strongest in the post-game when you're allowed to freely explore the ship. You know, when there's no story to interrupt you every 10 to 20 minutes. Also, the first-person switching worked surprisingly well given the limitations. I used to have an issue with being stationary, but apparently the dodge mechanic will activate if you switch out of first-person before an impact which helps add some flow to the first-person combat, and the only time it should really be disorienting is if you're not paying attention to the direction you're facing when you enter it. Fair points, I guess, given their control layout limitations and all, but I still didn't like where they went with the idea. This time Samus has an automatic lock-on feature for when she's in normal view, where she'll target enemy closest to her in the direction she's facing, 
This allows small hordes of enemies to be taken out with little to no problem, and becomes even easier once the diffusion beam is obtained, creating a scattershot-like burst effect. A welcome addition in my book. On the topic of power-ups, all of them apart from the aforementioned diffusion beams are power-ups Samus has had from previous games, since I guess she does technically have them from the start, including old favourites such as the missiles, grapple beam, screw attack, and some from the 2D Metroid series like the speed booster and shine spark, which I think translated very well into the 3D environment if I say so myself. Now, while I enjoyed the gameplay as a whole, there are a few moments that continued to haunt me throughout my playthrough, such as the over the shoulder sections, which as the name suggests put the player in his perspective over Samus' shoulders. While I have the feeling that this mode was created to build up ambience and tension, since it usually occurs at times when a room or area needs to be inspected, for me these sections feel more like a chore since you're unable to use weapons, or even the morph ball, but worst of all she moves at the pace of someone wearing iron boots. Someone wearing iron boots underwater. Someone wearing iron boots underwater while trying to traverse a really complicated dungeon. Someone... Well, what I'm trying to say is that she moves slow, really slow, which was enough to make me shout repeatedly at the screen as if she'd somehow hear me and start to move quicker. But arguably my least favourite sections in the game are the points where you're put into a first-person perspective in order to spot key items uh, to allow you to progress. While it starts out being fairly obvious, the later points of interest just aren't that obvious to locate right away, with small patches of grass that don't stand out from others, dark environments that make it hard to see altogether, and of course, who can forget the infamous green splatter which took me around 10 minutes to actually figure out what I was supposed to be looking at. Definitely not something I'd be welcoming back in the near future. Yeah, those over the shoulder sequences broke game flow quite a bit. Particularly in the research facility in Sector 1 where you're stuck like that for what feels like half an hour. Maybe it was half an hour, I don't remember. Also, for the first-person hidden object games, those are absolutely terrible later on. Granted, it's only bad on the first run-through, but that's like saying burning my hand on the stove stopped hurting after it killed my nerves. The visuals of the game are fairly impressive. While not being quite on the level of Metroid Prime 3, I think the aesthetic meshes really well with the old-school SNES throwbacks the game seems to be going for. It has a nice and vibrant color palette. Unfortunately, the skyboxes look pretty awful in the simulated environments. Just looks like someone is holding up a picture of the sky. Then again, it is a simulated environment. I also take some issue with the Sector 1 environment design. It feels a bit overdone. To the point, it looks rather ugly. Far too bizarre looking foliage. I know it's supposed to be tropical and otherworldly, but it's not that hard to execute something like that and still make it look good. Just look at the Thorn Jungle on Brio in Metroid Prime 3. However, I am quite fond of the looks of Sectors 2 and 3. They aren't anything special, and they're fairly generic looking, but they're at least moderately well done. With basic enemy designs, a lot of the enemies have carried over from the 2D games, all of which look really good, and therefore are uninteresting for me to talk about. However, whether it was Nintendo or Team Ninja, there were quite a few new enemy designs, ranging from chameleon things to armadillos and wall balls and... God, I hate these new enemy designs. They all look just awful and overdrawn. I mean, just look at these things. That being said, the boss designs are all well done, whether they be the new designs or the throwbacks. I do take some issue with the fact that almost all the good bits in the game are just old-school throwbacks, while the new designs are handled rather poorly, with the exception of bosses, but overall I'd say the visuals get a pass. Soundtrack? The ambience! I mean... Yes, I was just listening to it. Fascinatingly derivative. <clears throat> Musical monocle here. 
The soundtrack to Other M does such an efficient job at emulating the atmosphere of the game in a manner that befits the series as a whole, that if you were to notice the music at all, you still might not notice how new many aspects of it is in comparison to the soundtracks of its predecessors. For one, the composer of this entry is actually completely new to composing for video games. However, in addition to seamlessly updating some of the more iconic tracks of the past, the new composer introduces new material that fit in with the thematic material of the game very organically. Another first for the series is the full orchestras that are utilized in this score. Again, the old mini works are emulated seamlessly but with higher quality instrumentation. The only issue that one can take with this perfectly natural addition to the series is that it does little to establish its own voice. If the rest of the game is an attempt to innovate through new presentation and a new creative staff, the soundtrack is more of a conservative and safe middle ground. And with that, the game gets a 7 out of 10. While the story had a few good ideas, it was let down by either bad writing or translation, and an outright terrible narration. The gameplay was actually pretty fun, though. And for the most part, the visuals of the game were really good. Not quite on the level of the Prime 3, but the few new bosses certainly stand out. Overall, I'd say it's a pretty good game. So there you have it. Those are our thoughts of Metroid Other M. While it's not a disastrous game by any means, it definitely doesn't live up to the legacy that the Metroid series has created. If you aren't familiar with the Metroid series, I'd probably recommend that you try out Metroid Zero Mission, the Game Boy Advance remake of the original Metroid, or Metroid Prime for the GameCube if you'd prefer a first-person shooter slash puzzle adventure, both of which are equally great games. Uh, now time to insert some shameless self-promotion. So if you want to see more of me in my reviews, check out my channel, Outlaw Client. Oh, and I also have some... And that's all the time we have for today. Next time I'll be reviewing The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the N64. If you enjoyed this review, make sure to like and subscribe, and definitely go check out Outlaw Client to his channel. There will be a link in the annotations and in the description below. Have a good night.